Hi, I'm John Keenan, State Senator for Norfolk and Plymouth District, representing the city of Quincy and the towns of Abington, Braintree, Holbrook, and Rockland. I want to thank you for joining me today for another episode of Bringing Beacon Hill to You, a program designed to bring what we do up here at Beacon Hill right to you in your home and in your neighborhood. Um, this is the second episode of Bringing Beacon Hill to You, and the first episode focused on the budget process. This episode will talk a little bit about what goes into a particular budget relative to revenues and expenditures to give you an overview of, of that. The third episode will be uh, an episode that takes a closer look at the fiscal year 2015 budget as it's being prepared and what we can expect from that budget. So uh, like with any budget, I guess we'll start. Um, before you determine a budget, you have to figure out how much money you have to spend and then you decide how you're going to spend that money. So here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we go through a process um, that results in a balanced budget. As I said earlier in uh, my previous show, we are constitutionally required to have a balanced budget. In December of 2013, the governor, his secretary of administration of finance, the uh, House and Senate committees on ways and means, all met to come up with what they call consensus revenue figure. That's the amount of money that they'll have from state revenues that will be available to fund the state budget. Now, there are other revenue sources as well. Uh, federal money comes into play. Uh, reserve accounts come into play. There are other ways and other funds that are contributed to the budget. But the key to the budget is determining how much state revenue there will be, how much money will be generated here at the state level. So they take a broad look at the economy while they're trying to determine what money will be available. They look at the strength of the economy. They try to determine and predict what will happen to the economy over the course of the fiscal year. They bring in academics. They bring in economists from banks and from advocacy groups. And with all that information, they arrive at a consensus revenue figure. And for a fiscal year 2015, the upcoming fiscal year, that consensus revenue figure is $24.3 billion. So where do the revenues come from? Well, they come from a whole host of of areas. Um, for instance, uh, we have money that comes from uh, a tax on alcohol, cigarettes, corporations, deeds, estate inheritance, financial institutions. The big one is the income stack tax, the state income tax. We uh, have motor fuels tax, public utilities tax, uh, room occupancy, sales tax on meals, a regular sales tax, uh, motor vehicle sales tax, unemployment insurance surcharges. It makes it sound like we have an awful lot of taxes. But I can assure you, and we'll talk about it a little later, that Massachusetts is in the middle of the pack, essentially, when it comes to the overall burden of taxation on its residents. Uh, just to touch on a, a couple of the taxes to kind of indicate some of the issues that we deal with as we try to, to determine revenue. For instance, there's an alcohol tax I talked about that generates about $79.2 uh, billion, dollars, uh, $79.2 million, I'm sorry. And that tax used to be uh, much greater. But a couple of years ago, through the ballot process, the voters of Massachusetts said that they did not want additional taxes on, uh, they wanted to take away the tax that had been imposed on alcohol. So they repealed a portion of the alcohol tax. And the result was about $110 million in lost revenue. Now that revenue uh, was used previously to fund recovery programs, treatment programs for people who had substance abuse issues. But that money came off the table because of the ballot initiative. So the state has to figure out another way to provide those programs with less money. Also, the sales tax. Um, the sales tax uh, was uh, the subject of a ballot question back in 2010. And the thought was that it would, uh, there was an attempt to cut the sales tax to 3%. That question failed. And as a result, we continue to have the sales tax in place, and we can rely on that as we prepare the revenue, the consensus revenue figure. Now, the sales tax, for instance, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, amounts to about $4 billion. So it's a pretty substantial uh, part of our tax base. As I mentioned, the biggest one is the state income tax. Now, state income tax uh, has been the subject of much debate. Uh, quite a few years ago, there was a ballot initiative to roll the state income tax back to 5%. Uh, that did not occur. Back in 1990, the income tax rate in Massachusetts was at 6.25%. In the year 2000, it was at 5.85%. And in 2002, a state law was passed that put a formula in place that will result in the state income tax rate being automatically reduced by 0.05% whenever the state meets certain revenue benchmarks. As a result of that law being put in place by the legislature, 
the state income tax rate is now down to 5.2 percent. That 5.2 percent took effect on January 1st of 2014. So if certain revenue targets are met, the income tax rate is cut, and that's what happened as of January 1st of 2014. So uh, there is a cost whenever those income tax rates cuts uh, go into place, and the slide that will come up on the screen will show you what the cost of that is. If, for instance, the uh, formula had not been put in place in 2002, and the income tax rate in effect at the time had stayed in place, then the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would have $1.8 billion more to, uh, from the taxpayers uh, to, to basically fund essential programs. But um, there is $1.8 billion less that the state has to work with. And that's not to say that what was done was right or wrong, but just the realization that that money had been available. If it was still available, it would mean $1.8 billion more in additional services uh, that would be available to the residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Additionally, there's been change in the dividend and, and, and interest rate uh, taxes, and also the uh, personal exemption was increased. So in total, over the last several years, uh, essentially since 2002, there's been about $3.2 billion that have stayed in the taxpayer's pocket instead of being uh, sent to the state house for expenditure. And that money has helped the economy. There's no doubt people have that money to spend. But it's also resulted in a, a cutback or a, a drawing back of certain essential programs that have been offered over the years. And we'll get into that a little later. The next slide that will come up is to give you a sense of where Massachusetts stands relative to the rest of the country um, on property tax and income tax combined. And you'll note that the U.S. Uh, back in 2011, this is the date that we have the most recent figures for, um, the, uh, was at about 10.6 percent the combined effect of local property taxes and state income tax. And Massachusetts burden was at about 10.4 percent, so slightly below. Massachusetts is just about in the middle of the pack when it comes to the combination of income taxes and property taxes. So there's a sense, once you get your revenue figure, of determining the priorities for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for the state, and how do you determine those priorities in the state budget. Well, as I uh, discussed in the first program, um, there is a, a whole effort that is undertaken very early in the process by the governor, the House, and the state senate as far as gathering information, putting together facts and figures, reviewing all programs, and coming up with as comprehensive a budget as possible within the boundaries established by the consensus revenue figure. So I'd like to walk through a little bit, uh, a few slides that detail what has happened at the state level relative to spending. Now keep in mind that in 2008, the end of 2008 and into early 2009, uh, things changed drastically here in the Commonwealth and across the country and in fact across the world. Uh, the United States entered into a pretty severe recession and that had an impact here in Massachusetts as far as the revenues that we were able to generate to support budget priorities and also our ability to provide certain programs within those priorities. And I'll touch on that as we go along. So the first slide that you'll see is a total annual budget spending. It gives you a history dating back to fiscal year 2001. And you'll notice that there's two things. There's two lines on this slide and on the following slides. One should appear as a yellow line. And that means that's what was actually spent. It has not been adjusted for inflation. And the other one should be a red line that shows you inflation adjusted. Now the reason we do that is because we all know that what you spent a dollar on a year or five years ago doesn't get you as much today. And that's how it works in government as well. If everything was level funded, the cost of providing those services goes up. So the number of services, the amount of services, and in fact the quality of services may decrease if you're not able to allocate it. So I think it's, it's wise to look at all these uh, matters through the lens of actual spending and then also inflation adjusted spending. So when you take a look at that overall uh, annual spending by the Commonwealth from 2001 to uh, anticipated 2015, you'll see that actual spending has increased. But you'll also note with the red line that when you account for inflation, um, it's pr pretty much been level spending in the state budget. So um, where is the money spent? Where is, you know, as, as actual dollars are increased, but inflated dollars, uh, cost of living dollars are adjusted, where do we spend our money? Well, a big portion of it, about 43%, goes to its health care. And the next largest area of spending is education, which is at about 19.5%. And you'll see a pie, uh, a pie chart that will show you 
uh, where the money is expended. So again, 43% roughly in healthcare. You see that education is about 19.45%. We spend about 2.6% on local aid. Human services, uh, nearly 10% of our budget goes to that. And then we have law and public safety and infrastructure, housing, and economic uh, development. So let's go through a couple of the categories. For instance, education. Uh, education is very important. It really is uh, critical that we allocate the appropriate level of funding to education to make sure that we remain competitive in uh, what is really a, a um, tough worldwide uh, economy. We have to make sure that we have students who are prepared coming out of high school to go to college or to enter into the workforce so that we can remain competitive. And we should also recognize that there's learning for the sake of learning as well, which uh, should be highly valued in a civilized society. Um, but in any event, overall education uh, spending, when adjusted for inflation, remains below fiscal 2008 levels. So the charts that's up there shows you those same two lines. One is actual spending and one is adjusted uh, uh, spending uh, to account for inflation. So you'll see when you adjust it for inflation that spending on education is actually down by about 5.3 percent from as recent as 2008. Early education spending, critical, is down 20 percent. Higher education spending. So many parents, myself included, struggling to meet tuition payments. Uh, meanwhile, we're spending over 12.4 percent less in higher education. In Chapter 70, which is K through 12 spending, which is state money that goes to assist local schools, is down about 0.7 percent since 2008. So you can see that over the last several years, education spending has has been curtailed uh, because of what happened in 2008. The the state had uh, fewer revenues coming in and had to uh, find the fairest way possible to allocate those revenues. Education spending is one of those areas that uh, suffered as a result of that. Next slide will uh, show you law and public safety. This includes funding for the court system, for legal assistance, for law enforcement, uh, and for prisons, and for prosecutors. And as with other areas, expenditures have not kept pace with the rate of inflation. Overall, when adjusted, spending in this area is down 17.6 percent. Local aid. Uh, local aid, having uh, been in uh, a city council at the local level, local aid is absolutely essential to cities and towns. It funds schools. It funds DPW, roads, sidewalks, uh, infrastructure work. It funds police. It funds fire, libraries, a whole host of local services depend on the amount of money that municipalities get from the state. Um, the local officials work very hard to try to get that money, uh, that, that level of payment from the state to the municipalities as high as possible. In, in my district, the Board of Selectmen in Abington, uh, Holbrook, and Rockland are very active. Mayor Sullivan in Braintree is constantly uh, pushing, particularly for money for road work, and Mayor Koch in Quincy is, is also a very strong advocate for local aid so that they have the funding to provide the services at the local level. So the story of local aid is not a great story. Uh, if you look at 2008 levels and compare them to the present, you'll see in actual dollars, not even inflation adjusted, but in actual dollars, we're spending about 26.6 percent less than we were in 2008 for purposes of local aid. And in adjusted dollars, it's down about 36.9 percent. Now, the cities and towns have done a great job of making do with less money from the state, but important municipal services have suffered. The cities and towns uh, are anxious to get road programs back in action to try to get uh, some of those um, uh, things that have been pushed to the back burner put forward again so that they can uh, get them up to the state where they, they have to be. Um, schools have seen classroom sizes increase uh, somewhat as a result of local aid. Libraries in a lot of towns have had to reduce their hours and only now are they starting to kind of expand those a little bit more again. Uh, so there's a direct impact on the amount of money that we can provide to the municipalities and the effect at the local level. So it's a priority for us. It's something we'll continue to work on. But again, uh, the history shows that there has been a reduction, particularly since 2008 when the recession hit. Now, the next one is human services. And human services includes child services, elder services, juvenile justice, transitional services, veterans benefits, emergency food assistance. And from fiscal year 2008 to fiscal year 2014, um, it's a pretty similar picture. Child service spending is down 16.5 percent. Elder service spending down 13.1 percent. Juvenile justice spending is down 14 percent. And transitional assistance spending is down 11.5 percent. 
Now what's interesting to note here is that a lot of these basic human service programs were called upon after 2008 to provide more services. Uh, people were in need of more services as a result of what happened in 2008 when the recession hit, the demand for transitional assistance, the demand for elder service assistance, the demand for child services assistance all increased as a function of the downturn in the economy. And at the same time, as the economy uh, downturned, we were faced with uh, less revenue here at the state level, so difficult budget decisions had to be made. So those budgets, they all suffered, and as the uh, economy turned, demand went up, resources went down. Now, we've heard an awful lot about DCF and some of the issues that they've been facing over the past uh, a few months. Well, again, there's a situation where a department was called upon to do more as a result of what happened in the economy and yet wasn't provided with the resources necessary to deliver those services. That's my opinion. Uh, also, when you look at EBT, we passed comprehensive EBT reform here in the state Senate. But we also have to recognize that from 2008 on, the demand for assistance, whether it be food stamps or other programs, increased because of the downturn in the, in the economy. At the same time, because of lower revenues, we had to cut back in those departments and weren't able to put in place the oversight that was necessary. So whether it's DCF or with EBT, we've uh, put those programs in the forefront now. We're addressing the shortcomings that exist, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to provide the resources uh, as the economy improves to meet the demands of those departments and to make sure that we're delivering essential services as efficiently as possible and with as little fraud as possible. Uh, there's been great strides that have been made in both those areas, and we're confident that we're going to, to solve those problems. We also hear a little bit about the debt of the Commonwealth. Well, uh, the slide will come up that will show uh, that the debt service is down slightly when you adjust it for inflation. The other area that we hear an awful lot about is uh, pensions. Uh, what's happening with the uh, state pensions? Well, you'll find that um, the pension payment that the state is required to make to fund pensions here in the Commonwealth is just up slightly when adjusted. Now, most employees in the public pension system presently contribute uh, about 11 percent of their pay to the pension system and are self-funding. Uh, for people who were in the system much earlier, they contributed 5, 7, or 8 percent. Uh, they didn't self-fund their pensions, and that's what they call the unfunded liability. And our payment, the payment that the state makes to the Pension Reserve Investment Trust each year is required by law, and it's used to fund that unfunded liability. Additionally, back in 2011, we passed an act providing for pension reform and benefit modernization. It is expected that it will save taxpayers $5 billion over 30 years. It increases the retirement age for municipal and state workers. It closes loopholes. It contains uh, something called anti-spiking provisions so that if somebody was making this much most of their career, and in the last three years their pay went, went up uh, very high, that the average would be uh, based on more than the last three years, which it had been traditionally based on. It also prorates uh, benefits based on employment history. And then one of the uh, amendments that I had filed, which was adopted, uh, the legislation eliminated double dipping by elected officials. So there's been major reform to bring the cost of the pension system uh, under control and make sure that we still provide uh, pensions to our state and municipal workers, fair pensions uh, for the work that they do and for the contributions financially that they make to the pension system. Now, it's interesting to note that, yes, our revenues have gone up. Spending in so many departments has gone down. So where's the money go? Well, a lot of that money goes to fund health care here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Overall, health care spending, when adjusted, is up 14.4% 14, 14 since 2008. Mass health and health reform spending is up 19.2% when adjusted. And it's up 38.6% in actual spending. Now, there are reform efforts underway, which I'll touch on in a minute. And as we sort through, the Affordable Care Act uh, that the federal government has implemented, we should see uh, some shifting uh, of dollars from the federal government to cover more programs at the state level, programs and, and services uh, related to health care that weren't previously covered. And we should uh, receive money from the federal government for, for many of those. Public health spending, however, is down 15.8 percent when adjusted, as is mental health spending down 8.9 percent. So the cost of providing 
health care has gone up, while certain parts of health care that we do offer, mental health and public health uh, measures, are both down. So um, what have we done to, to address this item that was uh, quickly becoming a budget bu buster? Well, in 2012, we passed an act improving the quality of health care and reducing costs through increased transparency, efficiency, and innovation. And what that does uh, primarily is it sets a benchmark. That legislation sets a benchmark that will tie the overall cost of health care to our state domestic product, so um, our gross state product, which is, is uh, a measure of inflation or a measure of cost uh, of products here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a measure of the Commonwealth's growth, so to speak. So as the Commonwealth grows, as the economy of the Commonwealth grows, over the next several years, until 2017, the health care cost cannot exceed the um, growth in the overall economy. So if the economy was growing like this, previously we'd see health care costs go up much more drastically. With this legislation, health care costs will have to match the growth of the overall state economy. So um, that should prove to be a, um, a way that we can control the overall spending, overall spending on health care costs. Now somebody's premium may go up, certain costs of certain services may go up, but overall spending on health care here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through 2017 will be tied to the overall growth of the economy. From 2018 through 2022, the legislation calls on the growth of health care to be less than the growth of the overall economy. And after 2022, it will be adjusted to make sure that we keep in line again with the growth of the economy. So it's important to note that we are reining in health care costs here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's not going to happen immediately, but we expect that it will have an impact, and the early signs are that it, it, it will serve to control health care spending. What else did the legislation call for? It called for alternative payment methodologies global payments where physicians uh, get paid one payment for the overall care of a patient rather than uh, providing a service, billing the insurance company for that service, providing another service, and billing the insurance company. So the global payment methodology is one that we hope will help reduce health care costs. There's also going to be a focus on wellness and prevention, expansion of the primary care workforce, and another key component is to expand the use of electronic medical records. And then finally, it does include some medical malpractice reforms. We believe that the totality of this legislation will look and will serve to rein in the cost of health care, which again have been uh, pretty drastic and have had a pretty severe impact on our ability to provide other services within our state budget. So that, I hope, gives you some sense of what money we get and how we spend that money in general terms. Um, the trend overall has been that since fiscal year 2008, state spending has been uh, moderated. It, when you look at uh, state spending adjusted for inflation, it has remained uh, essentially level, even though actual cost spending, actual dollar cost spending has increased. Um, we hear every day from advocates, from families, from elected officials at the, at the um, city and town level that we're not doing enough. And we hear also that in some cases we may be doing too much. The challenge of, of state government is to find that appropriate balance. The appropriate balance between a fair tax, whether it be an income tax, a sales tax, or whatever it may be, fair taxes and responsible spending. And we strive every day to try to meet that balance. So on this issue, like any other, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. You can do that, uh, as I've said, the best way is by telephone. You can reach me at my state house office at 617-722-1494. Call me with any concern that you may have. Um, also, you can go to uh, our website at www.senatorjohnkeenan.com. Uh, we have some information on there, and particularly it will reference or refer you to uh, uh, specific pieces of legislation that were filed, and you'll be able to track those through the system. You know, we also are on Twitter and on Facebook, and if you have, uh, if you prefer to use email, you can reach us at john.keenan at masenate.gov. And also, uh, a lot of what we do, we try to get to the people in the district, again, in Quincy, in Braintree, in Abington, Holbrook, and Rockland, by way of a newsletter. If you'd like to receive our newsletter, please send us an email, john.keenan at masenate.gov, and we'll put you on our newsletter list. We also hope to continue these programs to uh, bring Beacon Hill to you. Our next program will be a more detailed look 
at the fiscal year 2015 budget. And then as items come up, as issues appear, we will bring those to you through this uh, format. So I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. I know the budget isn't always the most exciting uh, topic, but uh, I think it's important, based on the questions that we get from people, to convey a little bit of what we do in the budget process, where the money comes from, how the money is spent. And again, our next session will focus specifically on the fiscal year 2015 budget. So thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.